one second. Preview was open one minute, open with preview. Yeah, preview is opened. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? Hmm. I'm just going to, the, my, my laptop's connected to an external monitor. I'm just going to hook, unhook all of that and just yeah, the laptop. That might be the reason. Yeah. Okay, great. Let me do that. So sign up, can we hold on to the live? Uh, you, or a... Yes, uh, so GV, we have some attendees. Maybe you can start with chatting with some of them and uh, introducing Typography Society briefly. Yeah, but are we going live now? No, no. Yeah, no, we are live now because it's 5 p.m. Mm. So uh, we have some 32 attendees in Zoom so far and some on uh, YouTube as well. Okay, okay. Okay, then I will share the screen there. Ah, sure. I think there's Dr. Santosh Sagar who's having their hand up. Yeah, Oh, sign up, you can see the screen now. Yes, I can see the screen. Yeah. Okay, good evening, all of you. Thank you very much for joining in. On behalf of the Organizing Committee of Typography Society of India, uh, I would like to welcome all of you. Uh, this is the eighth session of uh, online lecture series um, after we did our formal inauguration on the 15th of August. We had a lot of interesting talks and today we have two very important uh, uh, typographers. Um, I am very happy to introduce all of you to Arvind Patel. So, uh, he will be uh, taking this uh, forward. And uh, Ichi Kono uh, is a renowned uh, Japanese uh, typographer. We have two great typography legends with us today. It's a very proud moment for the Typography Society of India. So uh, they will be uh, talking about font design through the ages. A look at the pre and post digital era of font design processes. And as we start, I will introduce you to uh, Mr. Uh, Arvind Patel. Arvind Patel uh, strayed into the captivating world of typography during the publishing projects during his student days at Harvard Business School. This led him to quit business school to study design. He, uh, in hindsight, he concedes this would not have been possible without the sense of untested confidence that plagued many a business school student. In 1982, he joined India Today in Delhi and led the process of revising its design while helping a technical team to implement ATEX, the first magazine pagination system in India. The design and visual appeal that made India Today st stand apart from its competitors was largely enabled by the technology supporting its production. 
India today success earned him an offer from the Economist in London. He served as the paper's design director from 87 to 99, straddling his passion for both design and technology. In 1990, he designed Ecotype, a family of text faces in, uh, in a joint project with Gunlangur Brahim. This was one of the most uh, notable typefaces, which is customized for a particular news publication. There's a family of text faces now used by the paper. The two also went on to design Times Millennium, a digital avatar of the eponymous Times Roman for the Times newspaper in London. Back in India since 2000, Arvin recently redesigned the Hindu newspaper. He has worked on a lot of important projects in India. He was felicitated with the Lifetime Achievement Award in Typography Day in 2014. So, on behalf of the Typography Society of India, I extend a warm welcome to Mr. Arvind Patel. Over to you, uh, Mr. Patel. Oh, he has not logged in. Yeah, he is not here. I think he's in the process of just logging in. Okay. Yeah, I think you could mention about the QA protocol for Zoom and YouTube audiences. What is that? So you could just mention about the QA protocol for Zoom and YouTube. Well, after the talk is over. We will be having a QA session. The YouTube uh, viewers can. Um, give whatever questions you have in the comment box in YouTube. Zoom participants can type in the questions in chat. We will compile it and we will uh, we'll moderate it and ask to both the speakers. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. I'd like the, everybody to wait uh, for another two minutes. videos on or yeah yeah okay so can you hear me okay one second yeah hello 
my, my video. So what should I just start my preview? Uh, yeah, you can try it. If you can't, I have already opened your screen here. Uh, okay. If you want, I can also do that. Open. Okay, open. Yeah, I've opened it, but I can't see anything. Can you? Uh, anyway, why oh, don't? So I... You can talk. Okay. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm going to switch off. Can you see? Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, I can. I can hear you. Oh, lovely. Okay, great. So. Uh, anyway, uh, have, have we got IT on? I can see, yeah, I can one moment. I can see your screen, correct. Yeah. So let me begin. So yeah. I'm, I'm here to introduce uh, a highly accomplished typographer, but he also happens to be a friend. So I'm going to be in many ways unabashedly biased. And I hope I don't come across as that. Uh, anyway, this is to introduce Aichi Kono, whose own country has called him a cultural icon, an ambassador, uh, for various reasons, because you know he, he, he left Japan at a very young age. Uh, but next slide, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, now, this is not to blow anyone's minds, but in 1945, when the Hiroshima bomb went off, our speaker this evening, Aichi Kono, was four years old, and he survived the first attack, which was about 1,200 kilometers from his home in Tokyo. The second attack, which happened on the 9th of August, 1945, was about 800 kilometers. I think over about 355,000 people died. Fortunately, he survived. So here we have, because of that lovely, luck, lucky accident that he survived, we are now fortunate to have him speak for us this evening. Next, please. Yeah, so Aichi basically was a very studious student, uh, went on to finish school, and then he joined Carl Zeiss in Japan, a German company which was involved in optics. And this uh, involvement in optics probably helped him later in life when he got involved with typography because he was very familiar with technology at some level and also about ways of seeing, you know, seeing at a very microscopic level. Uh, and the one thing he noticed working for Carl Zeiss is that all the Japanese literature, he was working first in the publicity department, just didn't look right to him, anything set in Japanese. So he wondered why that was and everything he saw set in German looked perfectly like a DIN standard, everything looked just right. And um, he wanted to be able to do that for his language, but he didn't know how to go about doing it. But he had an instinct that something needed doing. So after years of working at this company, next slide, please. He decided to leave Japan in 1974, not being very fluent in English and moved to England to study printing because he felt that was one way for him to figure out how to improve stuff in print. And while in England, he studied English, became very proficient at it. And he spent four years at London School of Printing where he was steeped in the learning of typography. And among the first things he discovered when he was hoping to encounter an Englishman as his teacher, his teacher turned out to be a man called Trilokesh Mukherjee, who is seen here on the top right in a circle. Trilok Mukherjee was an outstanding teacher, continues to be, though he's retired, and he's the man responsible for putting Aichi and me together. Trilok was a friend of mine, and when I first moved to England to work for The Economist, he said, you have to meet one of my students, who's now a very accomplished designer, called Aichi Kono, and that's how we met. So people who say that the Indians are separated not by two, not by six, but two degrees were absolutely right. And to that, I had Japanese friend Aichi as part of our Indian family, because we all came together because of an Indian who happened to be his teacher. 
So having finished London's College of Printing, next slide, please. Aichi went on to join the Royal College of Art from where he got a master's degree and he graduated in 1979. And uh, among the various things he did for his thesis uh, was a study of uh, Edward Johnston's sans serif typefaces, uh, which was great because, next slide please, on the strength of that, he got employed by a company called Banks and Miles at the time, a very prominent English design company that had just landed itself a very, very interesting assignment to redesign the London underground typeface, which was originally designed, next slide please, by Edward Johnston. And uh, it was designed largely for display. And this was, Edward Johnston was a, as many of you may know, a, a, a fine calligrapher who was responsible for the revival of writing, illuminating, and the teaching of calligraphy in England, which then went on to influence various type designers, early among them Eric Gill, and so on. So, uh, including Rudolf Koch in Germany. So, uh, Edward Johnston, in many ways, is like the father of the revival of typography. And um, uh, when he worked on the London Underground typeface, um, he basically wanted something that was very robust, mm -hmm. built on classical proportions, but easy enough for draftsmen and sign painters to render because, you know, pre-production technologies weren't as easy as they are now today. So various people had to hand letter it. So it was a, a, a letter form that could be constructed easily. And then it went on to extend its application across various things. Having started as a display font, it went on to become a very good uh, text font and so on, used for signage among other things and also for the London Underground maps and so on. Next slide, please. So then Aichi, having studied uh, Edward Johnston was best suited to take on this task because it needed a grounding in in, in understanding the roots of where the London typeface came from, the underground typeface came from, and, and also an appreciation of a, 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 a rigorous methodology, which he had having studied at the Royal College and, and being a very skilled craftsman. What you're seeing before you is, is, a, is a letter, a fictitious letter he wrote to Edward Johnston, uh, which was published in a British publication in 2013 sharing how he came about to work on the revival of his typeface, which had outgrown its utility uh, uh, a, 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 as a metal typeface and as a display typeface that was first done in, in large wooden blocks and so on for use in modern technology. And, and this was the task his employers at the time, Banks and Miles had picked up, but they had no one to give the task to because it was such a daunting task. So Aichi was given this job and he spent lots of time studying it. And among the things he learned was that this was an extremely utilitarian font. It was designed for a specific purpose, which had kind of outlived its utility in terms of reproduction had changed from metal to phototype setting. And, and so London Underground wasn't able to make the transition. And the job for uh, Banks and Miles and Aichi was to be able to make that transition a smooth one. And so they had to redo the entire typeface, which at the time existed in two weights, regular and uh, 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 bold. So what Aichi did was he basically said, let's build the regular as the light. Let's do an intermediate weight, which is a medium, and then do another weight, which is a bold. And so he redrew everything and, and that became the basis of the revival of the, uh, the new Johnston. Next slide, please. Uh, so that was his first kind of foray into a rigorous typographic exercise to take something that is deeply traditional as typeface design is. I mean, we all design typefaces and fonts and so on, but we realize that you can't have a completely unique shape because then it's no longer understandable. So we have to respect tradition, but within that tradition, we need to understand 
the technology that's being used to render that form at any given time and how best to design that form for that technology. And, and so that was the kind of thing he started focusing on. Having done the London Underground, the next task he had was to look at the telephone directory typefaces. Most of us use, well, all of us now use mobile phones. And with mobile phones, no one even knows what a telephone directory is. London at its height had five, four different volumes for its phone directories. It, there were like 24 million copies in print. There were 6 million subscribers, telephone subscribers in England. Uh, in, in total, 27,000 tons of paper was consumed in the production of these directories. Uh, so, so it was an extremely wasteful exercise. And the task that Aichi took on was to say, okay, how can we use typography to kind of conserve space, improve legibility, and save paper? And so he started work on the design of the London Underground, um, London Telephone Directory typeface. Next slide, please. And this was an extremely rigorous, rigorous study. You can see there were all these beautifully hand-lettered notes on top different settings, a lot of it pasted by hand, just to do comparisons between leading and so on, until he arrived at some consensus on what to use. What is interesting is that, next slide please. When he came up with a final solution, it wasn't just the design of the typeface. He looked at everything and the way the type directory was being set. And he says, you know what? If we have a last name like McDonald, we don't have to repeat it on every line. So let's have it on top of the page. And then we'll have a little lead in marker and then the person's initial. So this way we conserve space. So it was both a very sensible design solution as well as a outstanding typographic solution. So effectively he was able to compress more text by, by, by increasing the X side, reducing the uh, ascenders, descenders, so you could get more names per column. Instead of three columns, he set everything in four columns by getting rid of the last name and so on. He was able to conserve space. And this whole exercise in its first printing saved something in the order of about six million pounds in paper costs. Next slide, please. Now, to give you a, a background, at the time Aichi did all this, everything had to be done by hand. So these were the kind of tools he was using. Everything was drawn by hand. He had a scalpel with which to scrape things to get just the right proportions. He had a special viewing magnifying glass. These are the camera you're seeing at the bottom right hand corner. <laughs> it's called a stat camera, <clears throat> which was used to make large prints of each character. So you could touch it up and do things to it that you couldn't by hand and so on, but this was a very time consuming, tedious process. And he did all this, every letter, every weight was done by hand. Next slide, please. So now I'm just gonna run through two or three slides to show you the process he went when he was doing this. This is part of the London Underground typeface, all done by hand and see how much work you had to do. Done on graph paper, everything is rendered by hand. Next, please. Next, again, see tracing of every character, then notes everywhere, what kind of compensations to make, what kind of things to do. Next slide, please. Again, deep notes on proportions, weights, stem width. So again, it's the drawing, it's the understanding of each form by doing it by hand. So it's not as simple as just sitting on a computer, having daisy curves and knocking it out, which of course, in the hands of skilled people produces great stuff. But the rigor and the discipline you get doing stuff by hand is a whole different feeling. And he's been through that. So in that sense, he's kind of a Zen master when it comes to looking at letter forms and rendering them by hand. Next slide, please. Having outlined everything, you then go and fill everything by hand. So you do this for every letter and it's done very clean. Next slide, please. 
Now here you'll see like little nicks at where the where the terminals and the stems meet. These were ink compensation marks which had to be digitized in order to make sure that when the letter was printed, uh, it didn't get blurred. Next slide, please. Uh, so the London, the Johnston typeface, which he started as, as uh, an exercise for Johnston, uh, for the London Underground, became like a, a lifelong passion for him. And he continued to pursue it in his own time largely with a view to kind of refining it constantly for himself and using the new tools. By now he was using photographer, he was familiar with the computer. So having started something by hand years ago, he continued working on it. And here this example shows you the first B on the left was the original, then the new Johnston, which he started working on. Basically, he's just increasing the size, the X heights of the characters. Uh, and, and just the widths, if you see the proportions, the stems and everything, it's just being tweaked. You look at the lowercase i, by just increasing the x side, see how much bigger it is for the same ascender height. Likewise, the g, which is on the extreme right, see how much bigger it appears by reducing the descenders. So, so this is an exercise he's continued to do. And uh, next slide, please. So having, having done a lot of work in the Latin scripts, uh, the ambassador, as this country referred to him, a cultural ambassador, decided in 2002, between 2002 and 2008, to, to start working on a Japanese font. But it wasn't just plain, simple work, because his main gripe with Japanese fonts was one, they, they look very crowded oftentimes because it's a very complex form. But when combined with the Latin alphabet, which is often done in Japan, because quite often uh, on, uh, words are put in English uh, with the Japanese text, they just looked horrible together. And numerals especially just looked terrible. So this was a task he had set for himself. He had some very clear ideas. And quite fortunately for him, uh, a very interesting man called Robert Norton was head of the typographic development in, in, at Microsoft. He was an old Englishman, a common friend to all of us. And Robert realizing that one of the things that was holding up the sale of Windows in Japan, Microsoft Windows in Japan, was the fact that it had a very poor Japanese font. And he felt that if they improved that font, it would really benefit the sales of, of, of uh, uh, Microsoft Windows in Japan. And so he brought in Aichi to work on this humongous exercise. And it was really like a multinational, transnational exercise with many people working all over the place, including China and Taiwan and so on. And Aichi was like the grand architect of the whole thing because he had the vision. And he collaborated with various people to do this, uh, among them, uh, Matthew Carter. Okay, next slide, please. So this on the left is what Microsoft Windows had before. And just see how terrible it looks. Uh, and, and especially the Latin script. See the word legibility, the word character. On the right is Mario, which is the typeface Aichi did with the Latin done by uh, 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 Matthew Carter, who he worked with. in, in uh, and And you can see the result speaks for itself. It, and, and among other things, this went on to help the sale of, of Windows, Microsoft Windows in Japan big time. And uh, Aichi got a lot of kudos all over the place for this. And it was a enormous work, enormous effort, and it, and it really delivered. So again, basically, it, it's a combination of being able to see letter forms, what they do, and making them do what they do in the best way possible. And if there was ever a person at that point of time in history, and, and you know, it's that right confluence of time and event. And he just happened to be there at the right time because he understood Japanese typography immaculately, he understood Latin typography immaculately. He happened to know the man who headed type development at Microsoft. He happened to be a friend of, of Matthew Carter, who had done a lot of work for Microsoft. 
So it was a collaboration of great minds, great skills that produced this. And I think we all benefited from it enormously. It won an award in 2007 for good design. Next slide, please. Uh, on the top, you see uh, Aichi's letter forms. You see the large X height and what it's doing for certainly the Latin forms. That's Matthew Carter's work. Uh, you see what Gothic was doing before, and you see when the two combined, how much darker the original MS Gothic in Windows 95 was, and how much more open the Good Design Award winning Mario was. So all in all, a very successful typeface that was able to combine both things, both letter forms, Latin and Japanese. Next slide, please. And here's his collaborator, Matthew Carter. Next slide, please. Uh, among the other collaborators that Aichi had was uh, uh, a very, very, very distinguished letter carver called, uh, uh, this was uh, Mr. Kindersley, David Kindersley, very famous man. David ran a, a fantastic studio and um, he was a student of Eric Gill he learned stone carving from Eric Gill. So now if you look at lineage, Eric Gill studied under Eric, uh, uh, under Edward Johnston. So, so you can see this lineage and it continues. And Aichi was able to work with both Lida who married D uh, David Kindersley. And, and the thing with letter carvers in stone is they have a very, very acute sense of letter spacing because they are working in stone they're looking at every letter as it stands next to another letter. And spacing ultimately is how you're able to look at what is before and after each character because that is what defines good spacing. And letter carvers have that innate sense of being able to space things very well. Admittedly, they work on a very large scale, but what they're able to do with spacing, most people on computers can't ever even imagine doing. So David, with all that kind of a background, had various ideas about optical spacing. And he collaborated with some engineers at, at Cambridge. Uh, next slide, please. And basically, his whole thing was that you have to measure the optical density of every character and then see it relative to the optical density of every character before and after. And that should kind of allow how you space things. And so Aichi was able to work with them and apply some of these principles in, in some Japanese fonts he worked with. So effectively, again, a great confluence of time and event. You, you meet people with this immaculate uh, lineage, great tradition, who all collaborate and put do amazing things using technology and take typography to the next level. Next slide, please. And this is my final slide to introduce Aichi, which is, uh, uh, this is from I am I'm Imprint, a private press. Uh, again, they're doing this beautiful handset typographic poster using Johnston Sands. And it's a typographic gem of purity and intellectual honesty as they refer to Johnston Sands, because it was ultimately a very utilitarian, humane, functional typeface. Okay, next slide, please. And with over uh, with this, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, over to Aichi. Has Aichi been able to log in? I'll have to check, sir. I'll just, just check. Yeah, let me get him on the phone. Yeah. Yeah. Konosan, have you been able to log in? Um, because they're waiting. Oh, sorry about that. And I, I, I didn't really. Okay. Um, it's Zoom. Um, 
HTTP this one, yeah? Yeah. Just, yeah, and then just, just add out, yeah? You just log in with your credentials and so then you'll be able to present. And if you have any problems, he has the presentation, he'll show it on his screen and then you sure. can talk through it. Okay, and um, sorry, I didn't realize. Uh, it's, it's a, my name is uh, just a, my name is okay. Just a, Your name, no. Aichi, but you have to use the password they gave you. Not the password, your email address. Um, it says my name and then also email. Oh, okay, so just log in. Um, my name, email. Okay, are you? Okay, if you're having difficulty, are you having difficulty logging in? I uh, just hold on. Yeah, and connecting it says. Or, or, okay. Okay, GV, can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, but... I have this PDF file, I already opened it. Okay, Aichi. Are you able to log in? Hello? So, how can I log in? Okay, if you... You can ask him to log in whichever Zoom login he has. Then I will use the slides from here. He's, look, if you can't present, we, we have the presentation here. All you need to do is quit out of Zoom, restart with using that link. And then once you get in, uh, Professor GV will show the slides on his screen. And you need to just talk through it then. Um, GV, you could share the participant Zoom link with uh, with Professor Aichi, and then we can uh, get him in and uh, move him as a panelist. Yeah, that is what I will uh, always yeah. do. Yeah. He's, connecting. He's connecting, he says. Okay, so let him connect. I will change him into panelist. He, okay. okay. Ask him to log into Zoom somehow. Have you logged into Zoom? No, no, use the link at, in your name. If he doesn't I, use the link, it is fine. Let yeah. him log into Zoom somehow, and then I will change this into panelist. Are you using your email address to log in? Yeah, what's the... Sorry about that, GV. No, oh, that's okay. I, you tell him that I have sent him an email with the link. Again. I, I just sent you an email with a link. Can you use that? So he will come directly to this meeting. Yeah, you join. The, just use that link that's just been sent to you. Email. 
Otherwise, tell him uh, some. Uh, if he must be having a Zoom login. He does have a Zoom login. Huh? Yeah. So just log in, then we will change it from here. We will give him the screen sharing rights from here. Okay. Any luck, Aij? I think I just got the uh, yes, and then and uh, log in to the Zoom. Yeah, yes. please use that. Use that link. Allow. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and then still I, I'm being asked for your name and your email. Yeah, just put Aichi and put your email. Okay. The email that we gave them, which is BT Internet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then I see. Oh, I got it. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. I'm hanging up. So. Yeah. All right. All right. Hello, Hichi Sun. Now you can start. Um, if you like, you can. Share your screen. Otherwise, I can share the screen for you. I think. Why don't you just share your? Uh, why don't you do the presentation? We'll talk through it. Now, Aich needs to unmute himself. Yeah. Hello, Aich. I'll call him. He's still mute, is he? <laughs> yeah. I have already shared the screen. Okay. One second. I'll just tell him to unmute. Sign up. Can you see the screen? Yeah, Jibi, I can see the screen. So ask Aichi to start talking. I will move the slides yeah. for you. Yeah. Now he needs to unmute himself. Yeah, he's asked to unmute. Kono san, yeah. you need to unmute yourself. Go to preference. You're, you're on mute. Your sound is suppressed. Yes, yeah, I said I'm mute, yes. <laughs> okay. Is he okay now? Yeah. All right, okay, bye. Also, you can hear me. Yes. yes. I will move the slides from here. You can just tell me when to go to the next slide. Oh. You can start talking. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, <laughs> Thank you for guiding me all this and uh, inviting me. Thank you. It is our... Pleasure and honor. Namaste. At the moment, what I see is um, uh, the first page of my presentation. Yeah. Should I go to the next one? Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. It comes out on automatically. Yes. <laughs> He's doing it. <laughs> so um, I should say something about it, yeah? I would think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this is uh, three characters from top to bottom um, in the middle. And uh, letters are cast, uh, if it's a typeface, cast in a square body. Uh, that's um, uh, top is a heaven or sky, and then middle is a human or person. And then bottom one is a ground or earth or soil. And then they are all um, actually origin is a uh, Chinese, Chinese writing, Chinese um, uh, actually typeface as well. But they, um, probably almost three, four, five thousand years ago, um, that's uh, developed. It, it is uh, called ideogram or ideogram. And then it's, a, it, it's in a way, um, uh, started from uh, the pictogram, just like a hieroglyphics, and then uh, they stylized and uh, developed in a different way. And then these um, the characters, uh, actually Chinese writing, um, uh, actually came from uh, China to Japan about 1500 years ago. 1,500 years ago, apparently. And um, that came with uh, Buddhism um, 
first originally from India and then through China to Japan. So um, Buddhist philosophy is very much um, part of a uh, foundation of a Japanese philosophy thinking. Um, and then Japan has a different uh, uh, pagan sort of or, uh, the religion called Shinto, and they mixed up everything. And nowadays, even Santa Claus is mixed up. And that's a kind of Japanese background, really. And then um, 1500 years ago was a um, big change, uh, although uh, Chinese writing uh, introduced, uh, brought into Japan, but the Japanese language is um, surprisingly very, very different from Chinese language. And linguistic term, uh, Chinese language is called polysyllabic. Intonation is very important. But the Japanese, they are, uh, oh, the Chinese is a monosyllabic. And um, intonation is very important. But the Japanese is um, polysyllabic. A bit like um, sort of uh, uh, Latin kind of uh, language. So uh, often Spanish and Italian people, they say very much uh, for them to easier to pronounce the Japanese sound and, and the vice versa. And uh, so in, um, Japan actually developed uh, their own phonetic alphabet. Um, so equivalent of ABC or many of Indian language as well. And then um, nowadays about, uh, not about, it's 46 um, phonetic script to write. So, uh, but in the middle of this uh, screen, you see uh, top to bottom uh, heaven, human ground. They're all Chinese uh, characters and then even uh, Japanese phonetic script are um, the, the simplified from um, some of the characters, not from all these. Um, it's Chinese uh, characters are normally uh, the um, more than a few thousand. Uh, so every day is a newspaper uh, in order to read it. And in the old days, um, often people say, uh, took 20 years or so after uh, being born and then learning. And uh, it's um, very much a difficult thing, but Japanese. So uh, phonetic script is um, after 1500 years ago. So about uh, 1200 to 1000 years ago uh, became uh, very much popular. And then the first one was adopted by really uh, first writing. Uh, it's um, uh, women actually liked uh, writing all this uh, Japanese language uh, phonetically. And the famous um, novel, uh, which is uh, said to be the first novel written by woman uh, in the world is a tale of Genji, uh, you must have heard. And uh, then in, uh, in the old days, often, people called uh, Japanese phonetic script, kana, it's called, uh, is a woman's writing um, because uh, men are always uh, always too conservative and they always kind of proud of, they knew lots of Chinese characters and then uh, still stuck on the uh, difficult writing. But uh, nowadays we use mix um, because um, there are a great advantage of um, using Chinese characters as well, uh, which is um, later I probably, if I have a chance and then I can describe. Um, uh, very much now um, when you come across um, the um, face, uh, you know, the, um, the emoji, it's uh, moji is a Japanese uh, word. Um, it's um, emoji. It's a uh, very much uh, sort of uh, the the sort of like a, a, a development. First, sort of uh, uh, part of uh, kanji characters evolve. So, um, and then um, the square 
format is um, very much I just realized when uh, all of you asked me to join in this uh, the, the, uh, talk. Um, I started feeling um, my background is very much kind of um, uh, the, the fixed with a, a square. And then why that? And then as a typographer, yes, um, even if I nowadays I use a lot of um, Western alphabet and uh, even design it, but um, square is a quite interesting thing, I thought. So anyway, so I'd like to take you to uh, my background, uh, how I lived, and then, uh, then probably I could um, talk about it more sort of uh, wider prospect uh, subject of it. Okay, next one. Um, yeah, welcome to Japan. And um, so I want to talk about fair and the square. So um, I guide you to first uh, how we live um, Japanese house. So there's an entrance. And then that's just, you can see a door. And then next. And this is typical of um, you come in to open the uh, front door. And then you can see um, you, you have to leave the um, shoes, whatever you are wearing. And then uh, whether that's a barefoot or you have a, um, often people use, um, the slippers up uh, in, inside the house or barefoot. This is a little bit wider sort of entrance and uh, you can see um, how they keep um, the shoes and bicycles, everything before you go into a living side. So next slide is actually showing you know, people visiting Japan uh, from different parts of the world, they are asked to take off shoes. So getting into your room, uh, I mean, your next one, please. Very cluttered. But this is a typical of Japanese uh, living room. And you can see square um, cushion and table and very much uh, this is the environment I lived in when I was in Japan. Um, television is a bit old. This is an old photograph and telephone is in the middle, you can see. Next one, please. Then uh, when you uh, going into the other room, and this is another typical household, but cleaned up because, uh, you know, uh, guests are coming in and it's um, a floor and the sliding doors and then left hand side you can see the um, a bit of a garden and uh, you must be wondered um, um, the, um, how we sleep and uh, we sleep on the floor and uh, it's uh, called a stone probably you know um, nowadays um, even uh, in London, there are places called Futon Shop to sell mattress. A uh, mattress is kept, uh, right hand side is actually a little um, storage space. Um, it's also sliding door to open and then... Uh, so next one, please. So you can see um, it's, it's a bit more classy. Uh, you know, um, but it's not much difference. So, um, mattress, uh, um, no, mattress, uh, tatami mat is um, um, one to two ratio, uh, it says. And tatami is uh, actually, it's a Japanese traditional sort of room, uh, floor, uh, flooring. And um, uh, normally um, made of uh, woven soft rush straw. And uh, I had um, in your days, um, uh, 
somebody, uh, my actually um, predecessor, sort of uh, came to uh, Europe and then asked, oh, where do you live? And then I said, you know, Japan and the Japanese house is like this, like this. And then and we sleep on the floor. And then the people thought, my God, you know, they're sleeping on, in a kind of cow shed or something. But it's very different, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, higher than the ground level. And then we put straw, straw uh, you know, tatami mat. And then it, when he was asked, uh, well, we have a proper mat uh, on the floor. And so it's, it's very much comfortable. And what is it made of? And then he said, it's a straw. And then even worse, you know, um, the people in the West thought uh, uh, that definitely it's like a cow shed. But anyway, um, sorry, I'm just uh, kind of digressing. But, and then the sliding door is called a fusuma. It's um, uh, again, one to two ratio and a sliding door. And it's made of um, wood and uh, uh, paper actually. And then and, um, further uh, uh, on is um, uh, bottom is a glass, it's a square format. But uh, top is um, translucent paper screen is attached. And then that's also sliding door, but um, it's called a shoji, top one. It's um, uh, another very uh, much uh, Japanese uh, uh, thing, uh, Japanese paper and translucent uh, light is very nice, soft light. And then outside you can see um, a garden, a bit of a green. And uh, often, easily, you can actually take off all this sliding door and then it's so open because the Japanese summer is uh, quite um, hot and humid. So take off all these sliding doors and then wonderful breeze comes in. And then that's another beautiful thing. Next one, please. The size of um, tatami mat or shoji screen door or sliding door, uh, it's, they, they are all about three by six foot feet. And uh, one feet, uh, Japanese equivalent is show, say, um, it's, um, um, it's about uh, 30, um, just slightly bigger than a foot. And so next one, please. Uh, the, everything looks like a kind of a oblong or square shape, but um, the here and there, um, uh, Japanese has uh, interesting solution for uh, or uh, application of um, the, the angle. Uh, this is um, the, the coming from uh, different floor level to slightly up, and then often if it's uh, the 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 right angle or uh, the, then it's, it's more like the, it, it's a, you might trip and uh, accident happen this way and then, then very subtle way alerting, uh, you know, there is a different level. It's a very effective. Um, so this is a kind of design, uh, you know, uh, other way um, I learned without really sort of realizing it. And then so another, next one, please. Then um, the, we've been seeing Japanese uh, the room, but this is a corridor. Corridor is a, um, also, which is about three, three feet, um, so about 90 centimeters or three feet long. 
and then and the uh, outside sliding door is a uh, mainly glass and then when typhoon comes and or heavy rains heavy weather strong wind and then they have another particular sort of sliding door outside of um, the just outside of a uh, uh, glass sliding door um, it's a uh, uh, more sturdy wooden door so that way it's very much uh, Japan is protected for um, bad weather and uh, but uh, important is openness next one please so uh, you are in Tokyo and then you visited uh, Japanese uh, normal household, average household. Now, um, one of the, um, the, uh, the more bigger buildings uh, to visit, and this is a National Museum of Mo Western Art in Tokyo. Uh, that it was established about 60 or 70 years ago. And I think 60 years ago, yeah, um, 1960, around the 1960s. And then uh, designed by famous architect, uh, the Corbusier. Next one, please. So this is a famous uh, Corbusier's module. It's a, uh, it's a square format. And then also um, the three, uh, one to two ratios, um, human size. And uh, right hand side, uh, four squares, uh, actually the, um, the museum's floor plan, uh, ground floor and uh, first floor, second, third floors. And uh, Corbusier, uh, I heard uh, he was, uh, quite impressed by uh, Japanese unit system for the architecture and uh, it's been traditional for many many years so um, maybe later on we go back to uh, the um, another um, uh, picture for uh, Japanese household um, one to two ratio of tatami mat and uh, shoji screen suma uh, or glass door um, so uh, these are all two squares, uh, or sometimes even uh, tatami mat is uh, just one square to make more interesting arrangement. And um, uh, so these suppliers are actually it's um, specialized. So people who make tatami mat, they have a they are uh, they specialized. So uh, you know the um, craftspeople, uh, producers, and uh, shoji screen as a different ones. And so in the mid, uh, in, in, in an ancient time already in Japan, they are um, very much um, adapted to a mass producing a more efficient way. Anyway, the next one, please. So this is the inside as you come in. And then it's um, just uh, any museum, but um, in the middle is a square seating, uh, the stool, and then over there is a square um, entrance and a square painting in the middle. And next one, please. This is a Monet's. Uh, it is, uh, this is the one actually exhibited in that museum. So definitely we must have a square in Japan. Next one, please. The very openness is important. It's a grand level of um, museum's um, reading room. And um, famous, um, uh, Corbusier's Pirate is, uh, you know, the building is supported with a big um, pillars. And so uh, uh, this sort of thing is uh, very much, um, you know, uh, it's a modern um, 
house uh, or buildings. Uh, Corbusier's influence is uh, yes, very big. Next one, please. Uh, this is a maybe Corbusier must have given me lunch like this. Next one, please. So, the making very efficient way. Square lunch. Next one, please. Presentation is uh, quite important for yes, inviting guests and then uh, giving lunch. Next one, please. Suddenly, it's a different. It's um. I'd like to talk about um. Uh, a bit more uh, my own side of uh, profession, uh, designer as a designer, as a Lego. Um, it's a square, and um, interesting thing is Lego. You know, horizontally, vertically, or um, the. Uh, from top to bottom, left to right, horizontally. Um, you can make many different shapes. So square logo, let's see other square logo. Okay, next one, please. It's a very well-known international brand, isn't it? Next one. This is a London School of Economics, uh, very important institution. Uh, they, um, next one, Financial Times. Next one, General Motors, Microsoft. Uniqlo. Uniqlo is um, it is um, a Japanese company, but now international. And um, left hand side is um, Japanese phonetic script uh, derived from uh, Chinese characters, but uh, dropping the um, the the and is simplifying everything, but just retaining um, the part of the um, Chinese characters. And then uh, the, the, um, the sound is uh, just fixed, only one sound to pronounce. So left hand side up is a U, and then next uh, right hand side of Ni. And then come down and uh, bottom left is ku, and then bottom right is ro. In this case, it's a horizontal reading, starting from left hand side, yu, ni, ku, ro. Okay, next, please. This is a one, two, two ratio. And uh, before this, uh, actually the economist the name is placed in a slightly different uh, oblong shape. But um, this is quite neat to me. Next one, please. This one is also uh, that's an independent television network or newspaper or whatever. It's um, design is also two squares together. Okay, next one. Three squares. Everyone knows. So next one. It 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 is square has a very interesting um, you know sort of nature. You know, uh, this is a always I liked from uh, my. Um, 
school days when I was little. Three by three, nine square, and then four by four, 16 square, when you put like way, and then um, it's a equal number of squares, and, and they are five, five, 25. It's, um, it's Archimedes, uh, no. Pythagoras and the, um, yes, the next one, please. Um, so, um, as a typographer, I'd like to talk about um, not just the square, but um, what's in it, uh, or the logos, when you design logo. And then this is a before, after. Square is absolutely identical, but, um, uh, sorry about the uh, color is uh, slightly different, but uh, I, I just didn't have a time to make it exactly the same color. But it, it is just, um, you know, when you just look at the, um, the arrangement of letters, before is um, it's uh, just normal typeface to be set and then in uh, placed into the square and typeface is called uh, Scala. Yes, it's uh, uh, middle of uh, 1900. So about uh, 25 years ago or so, uh, it was uh, newly designed by Dutch designer, uh, typographer, type, type designer. And Scala uh, was uh, quite, um, uh, popular around that time because lots of people are uh, gradually sort of uh, fed up with uh, always Helvetica and it is very nice, um, uh, it's kind of quirky but um, a nice um, uh, sort of human touch in it, not the clinical and very nice. So Royal Academy really wanted every publication uh, is um, set in Scala. And then so they wanted to use the, uh, their um, logo as well. But something sort of not satisfactory. And uh, so uh, after they changed it this way, when you look at it and um, more carefully, not only just um, capital letters R is uh, much larger than, and, but um, the lowercase are more or less the same. However, a little bit uh, closer uh, to each other. So set tighter, which is um, more uh, emphasis on the, um, the, the kind of together. Uh, and um, also um, the, when you see uh, Royal's L, Academies D and the Arts T um, is um, more or less aligned. And then that gives, um, it's not um, kind of too rigid or anything, but it gives uh, some uh, kind of order and cleanliness, I would say. Um, so everything is more together. So that is the um, difference. Um, so um, space is important, but also when you place things and um, how you place it. 
and this and then certain making certain kind of um, the uh, arrangement for tidiness, I would say. Um, so that's a, a different sort of, um, often uh, typographers or type designers and then uh, graphic designers for designing a logo. Um, this would be the, uh, often people do this kind of thing, but, and, now, um, when you visit um, Royal Academy and then they changed to a new new logo, which is just an R and A, which um, when after I, I was given this task um, the 20 years ago, and then they used it until uh, about a few years back. And then, uh, so it lasted about uh, you know, nearly 15 years or so. Uh, logo changes, um, but at that time I uh, they suggested rather than full name, uh, they just R and A to um, do it would be um, much stronger. And then now they are doing it. That uh, that's another sort of so next one, please. Uh, moving away from square, uh, it's um, another uh, before and then after. And top one is Gil Sanz to put the um, fairly long name uh, inside its logo. But it's not really uh, kind of orderly. Uh, I mean, it's fine if you are given, um, I mean, you're shown. Um, but the bottom one is a uh, lot more orderly, isn't it? And the bottom one is a different typeface. It's um, but very much similar to Gilsan's. And again, like uh, Royal Academy's logo, um, new one has um, some kind of tidiness. And uh, what's the difference when you start looking at S uh, C I T Y and then Ampersand is a smaller because city and the gills is a very long. So, and then and is, um, you don't need to be so big. So, um, arrangement for consideration of for arrangement is um, certain sort of, uh, not only just a typographic, but um, the, linguistic side of consideration would be useful. And then COA, um, extreme left, um, also nicely sort of arranged. Often this sort of uh, arrangement is uh, required for a page setting, um, the rounded letter or uh, A like sort of, um, it's a uh, different from um, squarish letter. So often typographers or typesetters, compositors, they do um, the, uh, the adjustment for the um, every line of uh, typesetting. But when you do uh, this kind of thing, also looks much neater. Next one, please. It is away from 
um, square, but actually origin is a square. And then by now, uh, you must have noticed it is, it's a Fibonacci number. And then one plus one is two, and then three, five, eight, 13, 21, and so on. And then always the um, ratio is one to 1 1.618 and just um, infinite sort of number, but more or less uh, you can say one to 1.6. And uh, it, it draws beautiful um, traces, beautiful spiral and many uh, natural sort of flowers and plants and uh, growing and in this sort of forms. So square is a kind of origin and um, uh, square is not just always just a fixed it, it's a beautiful organic, uh, it will create. Okay, next one, please. And this is a, just a application of uh, design. Um, actually, the um, typeface is uh, redesigned. So, um, I mean, the um, looks like a Gilsans, but Gilsans is also uh, the, it's um, based on Edward Johnston's um, underground alphabet, London underground alphabet. And then, and, uh, so they're all um, just improvement of it or um, particular uh, use of it and different uh, variations. And this uh, City and the Guilds one is um, the, another sort of derivative of it. Uh, so origin is uh, Edward Johnston's um, alphabet. And then Edward Johnston's underground alphabet is proportion is uh, really uh, comes from uh, Trajan columns, um, the, which is uh, first century of um, the Roma, Roman alphabet. And um, uh, it's, it, it is uh, proportion is very beautiful. Next one, please. So um, it's um, Trajan Coleman's um, adaptation of uh, the modern architecture. Next one, please. Uh, about eight foot high, large um, steel door. Okay, next one, please. Um, coming back to uh, a Japanese um, phonetic script, this is called Hiragana and 46, and uh, starting from this time, this time is top right hand corner because we write from top to bottom and uh, also uh, left to right, but anyway. So uh, first, um, vertical column, um, vertical row, or it's A, A, and the next one is called E is I, U is uh, U, and then E is E, O is O. Then consonant is attached from top to bottom is a K, so Ka, Ki, Ku, Ke, Ko. Next one, Sa, Shi, Su, Se, So. Ta, Chi, Su, Te, To. Na, ni, nu, ne, no. Ha, hi, fu, he, ho. 
ま、み、む、め、も。や、い、ゆ、え、よ。So, it is very much like、um, the,、uh, the vowel sound of Japanese,、um, the right hand side, extreme right hand side, second one down is, so, e is, so it used to be different e was placed there and In the old days, people pronounced it slightly differently. So, ya, e, u, and the e as well. And、um, so nowadays, it's,、um, it's completely dropped. And so uh, it's uh, left open. Then next is a ba, ri, ru, re, ro. And then again, wa is a、um, wa, we, u, we, wo. So we don't have.、Um, Three of them, and then、um, is the、um, just、uh, the convenience and just place there, but n is a、um. so all together is 46 kana letters. And then, as you、uh, as long as you learn、uh, these 46, just like a 26, if you learn, and then you can write English. And you can write Japanese. But、um, the, uh, um, entirely written、uh, the Japanese or typeset、um, with、uh, 46 is very hard to read because we are so used to、uh, mixing with、uh, Chinese characters. A bit like,、uh, as, I, as I said, you know, phonetic script with an、um, emoji in it. Then, but emoji is、uh, so crude still because it's like a、um, you know, few thousand years pictogram. And, but、uh, kanji character,、uh, so called Chinese characters,、uh, the ideogram is an、uh, idio, is ideas in it. And then, few、um, the different. Um, elements to make one character, and then which means,、um, say,、um, so the heaven and human and earth, but uh, then uh, it's lots of different、um, uh, characters and a subtle difference of the heaven,、uh, or because it's a sky, or、um, You know, atmosphere, or and then a human or person, or、um, you know,、uh, male or female, man or woman, or difference. And、uh, then the earth is、uh, whether that's soil or, or you, you mean,、um, you know,、um, a road or a surface, or、um, then. Chinese character combining it together and they expressing、uh, lots of、uh, the, the subtle things. So,、um, Japanese、um, the normal、uh, reading text,、uh, books or newspapers, magazines, about、um, 70, 80. Or depending on the subject, or depending on the who is going to read,、um, about, I would say, around 80% of、uh, phonetic script are like this, and then、uh, 15, 20% or so are Chinese characters mixed it. But when I have a chance, and then I can describe that, it's an enormous advantage.、Um, it's, So, next one, please. When you learn、um, 46 characters,、um, it's, a, it's a bit boring, but、uh, it has、um, this Pokemon stuff as well. So, you know, Japanese kids, they can learn. When you see、um, uh, uh, right hand side of the top, letter A. And then、uh, right hand side of letter A is you can see the,、um, the alphabet A. It's, and、uh, 
left hand side is a little uh, character is uh, katakana which is also same ah it's a, it's in a way you have um the i mean in a uh, the the roman uh, alphabet um the capital letters and the lowercase letters that sort of way and then uh, middle one, main one, is called the hirakana, and then the left hand side, the small one, it's a katakana. The katakana is often uh, used for describing phonetically uh, foreign language. So uh, 46 by 46. So uh, yes, uh, 92. Very Next one, please. Um, 46 characters, uh, actually it's uh, written in ancient, uh, the, it's a poem, and uh, 48 has been used, uh, plus in one more, but 48. Um, the, as I described uh, bottom here, it's called Iroha poem, because instead of Aiueo, uh, it's uh, in the old days, um, Japanese children started learning Iroha. It's um, because it's all uh, necessary 46 or in the old days 48 characters uh, is learned in this way. And um, this is a beautifully written by, must be a good calligrapher uh, or person who can write beautifully with a brush script. And um, it's all hiragana and it's a very much like um you know the beautiful uh the italic script or uh, arabic beautiful um writing sort of and not like the um, the the kanji character which is um very much dense and uh, very squarish but it's uh, flowing. And uh, what's written is, it's, um, the quick brown fox jumps over lazy dog. It's uh, all 26 letters are, um, uh, you can see included it. The top one, Iroha, this Japanese poem, is uh, no, um, the, uh, same letters is used, very cleverly done. Who wrote this? And then what it means? It's a beautiful letter. So next one, please. This is a translation of Iroha. Although it's sent still lingers on the form of a flower has scattered away, for whom will the glory of this world remain unchanged? Arriving today at the younger side of the deep mountain of evanescent existence, we shall never allow ourselves to drift away intoxicated in the world of shallow dreams. And the poem is written by the monk called Kukai, uh, or we, we also call it Kobo Daishi. And he, he was a um, young um, Buddhist uh, or scholar at that time, everyone had to learn Buddhism and their writing, reading. Uh, so only just um, you know, a couple of centuries after the uh, really um, uh, writing system and then Buddhism uh, brought from China uh, or from India through China, 
to Japan with the Chinese characters because it, it's Japanese, uh, they didn't have a writing, uh, didn't have any letters. So he was one of the scholars and then young, and then he was sent to China to uh, study more. And then he was going to India even, but um, the, um, the, the journey and uh, his um, staying in China uh, was quite limited and short for many reasons. And then he came back, but he learned a lot. And he's the one um, who actually, uh, it is said, he was the inventor of Japanese Kana script. Okay. So, I will or Iroha. And then that um, the poem was written by him. Amazing. And he was not only just um, the philosophy to learn or um, the, the religious practice to, the, to, to bring to Japan, but uh, he is um, not only just a, accomplished a calligrapher, so-called, but uh, engineer and uh, invent um, the engineer and the uh, architects and um, it's uh, many uh, other technologies he also brought in. They often um, the people um, regard him like um, the um, ancient uh, Japanese of bit like um, kind of Da Vinci sort of uh, figure, uh, although he didn't really um, it um, Mona Lisa like sort of paintings, but. And um, so around uh, his uh, time, uh, of course, uh, he must have involved um, a huge temple was also built. Could you next one, please? When you go to Japan, now you can visit a Japanese style house, uh, which is um, it's Daibutsu Den, it's called. Daibutsu means uh, big Buddha, and then it's, uh, it's a den, sanctum. And uh, then it's uh, other name is a Todaiji, it's an Eastern Great Temple. It is a huge uh, building and not far from Kyoto. So uh, about half an hour by train, and then it's a beautiful countryside and a little, uh, nice city. And um, it's the influence is amazing, isn't it? And inside, as you come in, next please. Big Buddha is meditating. And you can see how small we are humans. He has uh, once a year, it's a shampoo. <laughs> so this is a um, sort of size of it, you can see. And the right hand side, you can see the uh, his uh, profile. Next one, please. So this is a sample of how we write. Um, 
from top to bottom or left to right, and then how hiragana, katakana, or you know, and then Chinese origins kanji characters are um, combined together. Uh, meaning is heaven does not create people above people, does not create people below people. And they, as you can see, um, important part of the words are placed, um, they uh, used Chinese characters because top one is then, I, we don't have to spell out heaven, but only just one, two, three, four, five, four um, strokes to make heaven. And uh, human, only, only two strokes in the middle one. And bottom end, only three strokes for earth or you know, ground. So um, only a little bit more complicated uh, kanji character is the, um, if the horizontal writing is a bottom fourth line in the middle uh, character, is um, actually to make or create, or the, depending on the um, you know, use of it, it's uh, um, meaning changes. So that's a, a big difference from any uh, other writing uh, form, I think. Um, so you can see the great advantage of mixing with a Chinese origin ideogram with a phonetic script. So this is uh, what we write. Uh, and then all characters, uh, whether that's a simple or not, everything is uh, placed in a square. Um, so because in the old days, uh, every character is uh, cast on the um, metal body. So easier to sit and um, so square is quite uh, useful. And then I didn't realize um, I actually grew up in a square form, but um, just uh, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think just what I wanted to present at the moment is um, just about this. Thank you very much. One. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. I will uh, initiate Q and A now. Yes. So there is one question from Sunil Kuller. Japanese forty-six kana. There is no j and no p. Um, this is one question from the audience. Yes. Um, uh, okay. Um, I, okay. I, I can now. Um, uh, what should I do now? You can answer the question. I'll read out the questions from the chat box. Mm. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, just um, yes, okay. So there is one question. Mm. How come there is no j or p in Japanese forty-six kana? Um, the um, it, it's um, uh, like um, kind of accent raise. Uh, you are asking, you know, the the um. Uh, French accent or German umlaut and that kind of thing. Yes, we have, of course. So um, I didn't explain that, but um, uh, then um, the, the, in a um, typography, you have to actually use the uh, square format and then put um, like a, a little accent, accent within it. 
And they saw um, more than uh, 46, of course, in that sort of sense. Yeah. So like a hahi fu he ho, you know, five characters become papi pu pe po. And then we place um, saku um, accent on top of it. Uh, just the right hand side top is uh, normally. And then um, the different um, way it's at two dots uh, instead of a saku, then that's become ga, gi, gu, ge, ko, uh, instead of ka, ki, ku, ke, ko, yeah. So, um, yes, probably you need, um, instead of 46, but um, uh, nearly 100 for each, yeah, hiragana and katakana. So it's um, very much, um, you know, the English, uh, they don't have an accent, but um, uh, some European languages, they have uh, quite a lot of, even the uh, characters are different, yeah. Okay, there is one request from the audience. That if you can switch on your video, they want to see you. <laughs> um, what shall I do? If I just open it, click it, uh, on the left side, there is one yeah. video icon. Okay. On the left, yeah. There you can start video. Start a video, okay. Then everybody can see you. Of course, many of us have, yeah, thank you. There you go. Looking beautiful as ever. <laughs> you attended your talk in Typography Day in IDC. Yes, it's a uh, oh, nice to see you. <laughs> a bit embarrassing, I mean, <laughs> but um, oh, uh, it's um, the size of Orbin, uh, the head is um, very big, and then uh, mine is small. That's it's... because I have a swollen head. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I'm sitting close to it, so I can step back. <laughs> There you go, exactly. Right, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm a desktop, so that's why perhaps, yeah, yeah. Um, you must be a smaller computer screen. Yeah. But... Uh, uh, Shekhar uh, Thomas, sir, has a question for you. Yes. Japanese design is so simple, but at the same time, why graphics on packaging is so busy? Mm. <laughs> um, they, um, yes, um, they, what he meant is the graphics on, on the packaging, it looks very complicated or crowded and very busy, like a crowded street. Um, do you think? Um, it's, um, um, can you help me, um, some example of yeah. the, hmm? Kamath is attending this, so he will definitely write something now. There are many people in the audience who have written a very insightful presentation. Thank you very much. We appreciate your presentation. Then, there was uh, one logo you had done uh, where the Scala typeface was used. So in the redesign version, have you done any uh, modification in the letter forms apart from the spacing? X side. Okay. Um, it's everything is so um, different. Um, did you say it would have been X height? Yeah, I mean, you. It kind of tweaked a bit. The, um, the everything is in um, you know cast in a square body. Whether that's a, even a single stroke character, or you know thirty six characters, 
And no, um, it was talking specifically about the Scala solution, the Royal Academy. Ah, Royal Academy is one. Yes. Oh, um, Scala is um, the yes, um, the um, the for redesigning um, the the um, the Scala. I mean, not the Scala. I mean, it's it's really the. Um, I, what should I say? We drew? Well, you can actually, you know, with a computer, you can distort it easily. And uh, which is, if you say it's a read do, and then you, I could do it. But um, the, I, I don't really remember um, how much of, uh, you know, the things that I changed it or, but um, the, um, slight difference actually makes enormous difference in Latin alphabet to uh, design it and arrange it. Um, like um, the, Old Johnston, which is original Johnston, uh, Johnston designed it, and um, it's an increase of uh, X height um, is only probably um, just around five percent of X height. Um, so, um, in order to make um, the kind of um, the more presence or robustness or, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's a very subtle arrangement actually affects, and which I didn't know when I started, until I started redesigning it. And I didn't have um, typeface design experience before, although a um, little bit of, uh, you know, changing letters and things for just a general design. Um, am I actually talking about right thing? Yeah, I think so. And, um, you, you know, they, I, I was um, just um, so-called school but really. I mean, five years uh, in a design school in London, um, uh, education. And before that, I never studied graphic design or typography in Japan. I just learned uh, by watching um, professional designers and printers, how they work, because I was, um, it's a kind of coordinating, and I'm, I'm a client side to make the uh, publication and things for that. And um, uh, so a little bit of um, um, just a gist of it, it's um, uh, kind of getting it, but um, then I became interested in the typography in Latin alphabet because uh, Japanese, I couldn't think of, you know, few thousand characters or more to deal with it, it's um, just uh, no way. I, I wasn't really kind of, uh, you know, the, the thinking to tackle anything in that kind of way because there's so many other interesting things or, you know, attractive things. So, but ABC was um, uh, very much um, uh, kind of in Japan is, um, um, a, a, um, popular because it's uh, you know foreign and uh, Japanese culture is um, the many adopted um, logos and things are the, the common and and, and um, so that's the reason I wanted to study um, typography. Um, in Latin alphabet, and then I found school, and I came over here, and then um, 
uh, certain things learned, and then it was a very much a um, good experience. I enjoyed it. And uh, lucky enough, I was given a job. Um, then I started working for a design company. And without knowing anything, first day, can you just make um, the fatter version of Johnston's underground alphabet? And that's, that's a brief. And then how could, could I do anything? Just, uh, you know, fattening up. And then so I started, you know, making it uh, heavier character. And um, then heavy character is already there. Uh, you know, only just a uh, um, Johnston uh, bold is um, the capital letters. So um, all I wanted is, um, okay, another 26 of lowercase letters. So um, how to make it? And then so, you know, as I said, I had no idea. So I just started to fatten it up from the Johnston's uh, regular uh, weight, uh, you know, standard one, uh, lighter one. And then obviously, uh, easily you can actually see it's um, very difficult to make just a simply heavy character because it's, um, uh, it's a counter is filling up and it become too heavy or rather clumsy. So um, I just made slightly bigger uh, um, X height in a way. And um, then um, to, to see how it works, um, then reducing the size uh, by photographic means. At that time, no computers or no scanners. So, um, but another lucky sort of uh, occasion is um, I had a, a few um, just single lenses. Some of them are uh, convex and or kind of concave. A concave uh, lens is very useful for you actually observe things in a very small size immediately. And in that way, at least you can't uh, measure it, but you can actually feel, you know, the size. Um, uh, it's uh, whether that's uh, the legibility or readability or recognizability is um, um, it works or not. So um, then just a normal photographic process to um, the reducing it or enlarging it and observing it. But I, I had to do very quickly because it's, it's not, uh, you know, the uh, endless time is given because it's a commercial entity. So, and, um, so, and, and then I, I thought, well, in that case, so why not, um, you know, making regular weight side is a slightly different as well. And then regular weight, um, when it's um, smaller, uh, they reduce in size and rather kind of uh, losing the robustness or uh, strong kind of readability or recognizability. So um, that is actually only just a few percent different of actual uh, the type height. And uh, that was a um, liberation. And, then, and uh, that's um, actually first week I found, I learned, um, they just um, learned by myself. And the reason um, is, uh, it's odd, but uh, the company actually, uh, I started working for is a graphic design company. It's not like a monotype drawing office or, you know, uh, linotype companies. And so whether that's a lucky or not, and then and quickly I, made um, the regular and altogether uh, regular face redrawing it 
uh, just the lower case, a slightly bigger uh, x height. And then and, um, the bold one is a completely a new uh, lower case. Um, it's much larger, slightly even larger uh, x height. So, uh, and then um, what I discovered was uh, regular face, when it's um, smaller and slightly sort of um, weak, um, it's a need a bit more weight for um, more general purpose. So um, I suggested rather than just a regular weight and a bold weight, something in the middle, a medium weight would be a very useful. So that's what I proposed to my boss first and then and made a presentation, um, the panels showing it. And um, then, but nowadays, you know, um, that sort of information, uh, I mean, when you want to learn uh, how to uh, make a typeface, and then almost every typeface is a medium and then light and then bold, extra bold or semi bold or semi-light or extra light. And uh, all the samples are there, but um, uh, come to think of it, it's um, uh, some 40 odd years ago. And um, it's completely different sort of, but um, only after 10 years from that time, and uh, the I came to know Orbin, I mean, Orbin a few years before that, but Orbin and uh, uh, Brim, and you started the designing typeface on the screen. And it's, it's um, then another 10 years, and, you know, it's a kind of embryonic sort of, you know, uh, time of talking to each other on the screen, but um, that, is really now, uh, you know, uh, become almost a norm. But somebody like me, normally, you know, now, uh, particularly locked down and then not talking to each other, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, 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 then I'm not used to, but now it's amazing, wonderful. And they come to think of it, actually um, 1968, was the first time a uh, screen, uh, video screen to talk to is on, on the movie, cinema, I saw. It's a 2001 sta Space Odyssey. And um, th that is the beginning of my, actually I would say career of typography because um, I don't know how many people actually on the screen here uh, saw that movie. I really recommend how many typefaces are used for the, the titles. And that was uh, actually a question I was asked because I was pretending I became interested in typography and, and I want to know. And then somebody who is my mentor later and um, I actually uh, somehow, because he was a printer, and so I wanted him to print uh, the things uh, for my company, and uh, he did beautiful printing and things. So I invited him to see the, the um, opening sort of, you know, premium, uh, you know, the 2001 to see in Tokyo and Stanley Kubrick and uh, great sort of, and after we enjoyed the movie, and then first question he asked me, um, did you notice the, um, the title? What typeface is used? Because he knew all sorts of things, and uh, you know, uh, the, the um, Western typefaces, everything. And it's uh, another time I talk about him anyway. And he was great. And. Um, um, uh, but by that time, I knew one typeface, Gilsons, yeah? So, uh, not Gilsons, sorry, uh, Futura. Uh, I said Futura, and then he said, no, no, it's Gilsons. 
what is give sons, you know? And, 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 it, and uh, he said, last one, uh, the um, older, uh, you know, uh, the, the people who uh, did the um, film, made film, and uh, then it's all set in Futura. So starting from Gil Sons and then they finished with the Futura. And that was um, a very interesting thing, you know, uh, when you compare. And then uh, novice, you know, they wouldn't really notice much of it. But also what he asked me is in the middle of it, and they, like, um, they gorilla-like sort of, uh, um, you know, they, they pretty human sort of uh, uh, figures came out and uh, they are running around and um, pick up a bone and then striking it and the bone actually jumps up into the air and then uh, that became uh, the spaceship and then uh, the story moving into the future. Yeah. So I have three more questions from the audience. Can I read it out? Yeah. Yeah. So one is uh, Shekhar Kamatsar has asked that um, in Japan, a lot of soft pale colors are used compared to India. Any reason for that? Like pastel shades, very pale and pastel shades are used, colors. Do they use such, such colors? <laughs> No, no, in Japan, in Japan generally, very soft and pale colors are used. Mm -hmm. When you compare it with bright colors in India. Well, um, the, um, I, I think I have come across that sort of question. And then one uh, answer to it I heard of is um, because Japan is um, kind of um, the... Um, the, the warm temperature rather than a very hot and a strong sun or um, very extreme cold. So, um, and then also surrounded by ocean and uh, so moisture and um, the kind of a they like a mist or fog, uh, foggy uh, landscape often um, appreciated. And, and, and then uh, Japanese uh, um, national flower, so-called, um, um, in India, it's, I see a beautiful orange color, uh, you know, the- Marigold. Uh, yes. And, then here in Britain is a uh, beautiful red roses and white roses and things, but uh, Japan is a pink, um, the uh, sakura, mm. you know, cherry blossom, oh. that kind of way. And they, uh, yes, um, come think of it, and it's uh, they they have, um, yeah. Um, I have one, another question for you. How many? What is the word count that? A whole page of a broadsheet no, newspaper will have in Japanese typography. The, how many characters? Huh. How many words will fit into one full page? Words. Um, they, in Japan, they don't have a word space. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they only count characters, and because it's a, uh, you know, they punctuate, uh, punctuated by rather kind of um, um, squarish and uh, fussy, um, the darkish uh, kanji character. Um, then uh, between them is a uh, uh, the simple form of kana characters and the kanji. And the kanji characters are more like a root of 
the、uh, word. And then、uh, Kana characters are like a conjunctions or prepositions or,、um, you know, the joining part of it. And then、um, important、um, part is、uh, the Chinese origin kanji characters. And so that is、um, percentage wise, as I said,、uh, maybe 20%. Percent or so,、uh, yeah, and、uh, some of them,、uh, well, if、um, you know the、um, the contents is、um, Buddhism to explain, or then probably 50 percent of kanji characters in a much darker sort of right. And、uh, newspaper companies normally have、um, need seven to eight thousand characters to set、uh, normal news. Okay. I don't know. Another question for you. New fonts are designed every day almost like mass manufacturing, new designs with different softwares. I would like to know your views on type design for the future. Type design for the future.、Um, they. I, I would guess variable fonts because、uh, you know, you're able to build in so much intelligence in the shape of each character that you should be able to flex it depending on context, which will become very useful on screens and different orientation. And if it's done at a very, very subtle level,、um, it can do remarkable things.、So、right now, you, you have super families that run into hundreds of different characters. And I would guess most people would find it hard to use that. Whereas if you have something that's intelligence based, that uses variable widths or height or x heights or any number of parameters, you could do unbelievable things on the fly, depending on context. Well, the、um, variable font、um, is actually it's,、um, the Algorithm is based on still very much um, the, um, the, the, you know, which way to vector to、exactly. uh, write and things. It's、uh, normally,、um, you know,、um, I think every、um, typeface designer, s when they want to change the weight and、uh, Um, you know, the, the,、um, the angles, you know,、uh, sloped、uh, form of letters and things. And they, we use, but that's a bit more automatically you can do it. And then,、um, so still、um, basic、um, the training、uh, of typeface designers or And then the future designers, it's a, it's a still、um, form, basic form is the、um, uh, unchanged, really. I mean, you have to still judge the、um, proportion is right or wrong.、Oh, I don't argue that at all. But I think the possibilities of doing things are enormous. But, but the ultimate test is the judgment. Whether Jud Yeah, judgment. and then, and then, and、um, uh, also, it's not just only typeface,、um, actually, it's、um, uh, because,、uh, you know, the, how we see it is、um, uh, if medium is、um, small or bigger, and then you have to change the,、um, and then that's also probably everything is built in together. So、um, it's still, It's um, it's a, it's um, it's a judgment, isn't it? Yeah. That, so individual judgment. <laughs> uh, um, uh, whether that can be done in a similar way of、um, uh, driverless car. Yeah. And yeah.、Uh, then. In that case, it's、uh, no、uh, judgment is necessary. Judgment is、uh, where you want to、uh, go and then get on. And what do you read?、Uh, what you want to read? 
and then easy to read. Right. Um, but so more like a driverless car actually give you, um, you know, most comfortable position of um, traveling <laughs> speed or, you know, um, softness of you know, relaxation or whatever. Um, so, yes, uh, um, definitely um, very, very highly developed artificial intelligence is necessary for yeah. um, judging even the, the, the person's feeling. Yeah, it is. But, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's a possibility in a, in a utopian future. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> that will happen outside our heads. Hmm. Arvind, uh, yes, yeah. we have out of time. Yes. So I would like to conclude here. I want to thank both of you for uh, all the uh, help and your wonderful presence and your support for this initiative called Typography Society of India. On behalf of the entire team, I would like to express my gratitude to both of you. Please don't thank do that. Thank you very much, Eichi, for coming and joining us. Thank you very much. Um, it's it's a. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I um I, I you know sort of I had a problem first on the computer itself and then struggling and then also, you know, still um the the um bit chaotic to uh, explain and things. So a bit digressing. Well, it's good to have both of you with us. Well, that's kind of you. Most people don't say that. <laughs> It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.